Um, thank you so much, Ingeborg, for your introduction. Um, I would say I've been working in the biohacking field since 2013, so this is kind of like a 10-year anniversary. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I always start off with this slide, the Astro World, because uh, throughout this presentation, I'm actually going to unpack what I mean by you know, us all living in the astral world. And what it means to live in the astral world actually means living with a kind of double trauma. So to summarize really quickly, the first trauma would be living with all of these toxicities, right? So all of these neurological, physiological, and reproductive effects, the physiological effects of living with toxicities. And then on the second hand, the double, the second trauma would be this trap that we're all caught in. And this trap is what is, what is preventing us from strategizing a way out of the astral world. So throughout this presentation, I'm actually going to show you how biohacking revealed the astral world to me, but it also helped me to find a way out. I guess it doesn't work. Okay. No, not not even. No. Uh, oh, I have to click. Okay. So I've divided this talk into three parts. Part one, an existential knowing. So I really love this quote by Ian Hacking, which states, we did not find sex hormones somewhere in a lost corner, like a desert island lost in the mist. We ourselves called sex hormones into existence. So when I first started open source estrogen, this was back in 2015, the first thing I did actually was I typed in the word estrogen into Google image search. And this is a screenshot of the images that I found. So as you can see, there are lots of signifiers of femininity. There's like larger breast size, smoother skin, and then there's also lots of pharmaceutical products, right? There's lots of pills that uh, uh, function for hormone replacement therapy, for uh, birth control pills, for contraception. So this made me think that you know, our, the public's primary relationship with estrogen is facilitated through the pharmaceutical industry. But not only that, but the word estrogen itself has been given a gender. It has been given uh, the feminine gender. So one of the first things I thought was, how did we arrive at this black box fact that estrogen produces femininity and testosterone produces masculinity. How did the molecules themselves become gendered? So as a biohacker, I started to look at not only the material itself as a black box, and I'm talking about the molecule, but also the symbolic representations as also a black box that we no longer open. And then as I went further on into my research, I realized that hormones are actually already all around us as a state of environmental toxicity. So I started to frame this as a kind of molecular colonization, and I'm using the word colonization to pose the question of, well, how do we decolonize ourselves, our bodies, our environments, and also our ideologies? So just to give a little bit of background about what's happening at the micro level, so this green molecule right here, that is the estrogen receptor. And scientists call this receptor highly promiscuous, which is an interesting way to describe a molecule, but what they mean is that it is highly, uh, actually it is not selective at all. So, Think of a lock that has many keys that fits inside. 
So I see this as kind of one of the biggest paradoxes of living in the Anthropocene, because we didn't expect all of these molecules from petrochemical, pharmaceutical, and agricultural industries to be binding to our receptors and communicating to our receptors, but they do, right? And then they cause all of these changes and basically altering and changing and queering our bodies. And then another very interesting thing about the receptor is that it is highly conserved among all animal taxa. So what this means is that if you think back to the first very ancient organism that ever evolved a vertebrae, and every single species that evolved after this ancient organism. So we all share the same estrogen receptor. So that includes every single organism that has a vertebrae. So I'm talking all the frogs, all the fish, all the bird populations, all mammals. So this is a collective species vulnerability that we all share. And in the words of Alexis Shotwell, this is beautiful and horrible all at the same time. So there's many uh, phrases to describe my practice. Um, I like freak science, uh, estrogen geeking, but the phrase that I like the most is public amateurism. And this is a phrase that was coined by Claire Pentecost, who is an artist and a researcher. So public amateurism, she describes it as the process of learning and doing and failing in the public sphere and removing the hierarchy of the layperson and the expert. So this is very much in the spirit of the way I do biohacking and the way that I work within communities and other networks of biohackers. Um, it's very much about that radical knowledge production that happens outside of institutional walls. And I'm saying biohacking as this, like, I don't know this term, but um, most of you are probably doing biohacking without even really realizing it. Um, I'm just going to go through some really quick um, protocols that have uh, come out of open source estrogen. So this is the yeast uh, biosensors. So we were using these to detect environmental estrogens. So these biosensors will actually turn yellow in the presence of estrogen. So this is a yeast that has been made transgenic by inserting the human estrogen receptor into the uh, body itself, the yeast itself. And then we have a solid phase extraction protocol that's using peristaltic pumps. So this is a method that you would use to detect estrogens from watery bodies, basically. So from rivers, from water supplies. And then this is a column chromatography method, which is actually featured in a workshop I'll do later at 145 in the wet lab. So this is a really great protocol for extracting estrogens from the urine because we actually pee out a lot. Uh, it's a very non-selective extraction, so we're also going to pick up melatonin, caffeine, and other kinds of stress hormones. And here's an image of what the output looks like. So this brown, uh, sticky stuff at the bottom of the tube, those are the hormones. And, uh, we might get a chance to smell some of them. So it's a very intimate experience. And then from these protocols, I actually made this uh, speculative fiction film called Housewives Making Drugs, where these trans women are teaching the audience at home how to make hormones in the kitchen. So this is one example of this existential knowing that I kind of touched upon in the beginning where when you start to dive into biohacking, you will eventually arrive at this new kind of interpretation of life. So in this film, like even though it's like speculative, it really opens the doors of what can be possible if you decide to hack the black boxes of the material and the symbolic representations. So this is a way to culturalize scientific knowledge. And here's some images of the mobile lab. So on, the, on this side, this is the yeast lab. On this side, this is the extraction lab. So you have the peristaltic pumps here, 
and uh, column chromatography here, and that's some urine. Yeah. In these pictures, uh, the mobile labs are actually presented as art objects, even though uh, I was using them for more of a practical purpose, uh, doing workshops. And here are some images of how the workshops look like. So um, I really like to embrace the messy nature of biology, but also the messy nature of a jam session. Right? So if anyone has experienced uh, you know, jamming or playing music in a jam session and everyone has their own kind of instruments, um, this beautiful song emerges, right? And oftentimes it's kind of unexpected. So this is the approach that I like to take with biohacking, where everyone is given a tool or an instrument and then everyone plays their own tune and then an amazing song emerges. So it's completely... Um, how do you say, it's like uh, we are just trusting and embracing the unknown. And it took me many years, actually, I would say like two or three years after I started open source estrogen to come up with this six-point plan. Because in the beginning, I didn't know what it would become, right? And in the beginning, I was just making these protocols for detection, for extraction, and then finally I started to realize like, okay, like these protocols are leading to something deeper, right? So the first, um, the first three points are pretty straightforward, you know, um, unboxing these molecular power structures and resisting the profiteering of non-consenting bodies. Uh, paving the way for more freak science and amateur exploration. This is all very straightforward. But when we get to points five, four, five, and six, we start to get into more like xenofeminist territory, right? So we're talking about uh, rejecting these definitions of normal and natural and looking to querying as a possibility to embrace the multiverse of possibilities. And lastly, I have number six here emphasized, considering the microperformativity of hormones, not only as a colonization, but as a collaboration. So I really want to emphasize this last point because it leads us into the next part, the next question, which is how do we live, act, and care in a permanently polluted world? So part two, alien tendencies I wish to no longer hide. In 2016, so a year after I started open source estrogen, I came across a scientific publication that uh, created a hermaphrodite fish. And in the title of the paper, they called this fish a hopeful monster which I found really interesting as a title of a scientific publication. And the reason why they called it hopeful was because they thought, okay, well, this fish can reproduce by itself because it has both ovaries and testicles. So it's a very queer organism that they created. And it made me wonder, well, why can't we also consider our bodies as being hopeful monsters? Because you know, none of us really have the, the privilege to uh, avoid exposure to these molecules, right? Because they find even PCBs in the Marianas Trench in the Pacific Ocean, which is the deepest part of the Pacific Ocean. So theoretically, we are all having queer bodies, right? You know, because I, I look on the internet a lot and uh, once in a while, I find these blog posts where, you know, people are talking about toxicities and it just goes really downhill. So to summarize this article, this person is saying, I don't think it's right that the government allows birth control pills in the water supply because it's making all the men gay and we need both men and women to propagate the human species. And maybe we should talk about this more than, you know, foreigners crossing our borders. So this article is like, it's very crazy to me, or not crazy, but it's very problematic to me because you have homophobia, transphobia, and even a little bit of xenophobia all in the same article. 
and it's all about how we are approaching toxicities, right? So this made me think, well, I'm not trying to, you know, shame or like cancel this type of thinking. It's more about bringing awareness that this, this right here is a lot of people's cosmologies. A lot of people, when they hear about toxicities in the river or in the water supply, they think like this, like, oh no, my body is changing, my genitals are changing, we're not going to be able to reproduce, and then all of this fear and panic follows. And so as an artist, I'm thinking, well, what is the origin of the fear and the panic, right? How do we avoid this kind of thinking? Not that it's like really bad per se, like, you know, logically it makes sense if, you, if this is the way your world is constructed, but how do we avoid that panic, right? Because what we see right now is this phenomenon where we're willing to perform surgeries on infants when they're born with ambiguous genitalia. So lots of intersex people are not even aware that they are intersex or even hermaphrodite people because they are corrected in the hospital. So, and if you think about it, it's based on very arbitrary numbers. Like, for example, here, they're saying, oh, wait, sorry. Okay. So they're saying a clitoris has to be between 0 and 1 centimeters, and a penis has to be between 2.5 and 4.5 centimeters, and anything in between requires surgery. Right, so how did we arrive at this practice, right? And who determined the numbers? And how are these numbers changing because we live in this very toxic world? And I, I really like to show this image because, so our main uh, strategy is to just clean up, right? It's to literally draw a border and say, this is the trash, and we're just going to pick up this trash, we're going to scoop it up, and we're going to put it out of sight. We're going to put it somewhere where we don't see it anymore, right? We're going to flush it down the toilet, or we're going to bury it in a landfill, or we're going to suck it up from the air and just push it out to another marginalized land. So I'm also thinking, why is this the main strategy of just barricading our bodies as if we were like these closed systems that we can just clean up, right? So I'm very critical of this strategy of just cleaning up because it's, again, reinforcing these purity politics. The purity politics that you see here that says that a male body and a female body must be kept separate. These definitions must be kept separate. So this is what I mean by the purity politics. It's not just with gender, it's with the, how we approach the environment too, how we approach the ecological. We just want to maintain the boundaries and maintain the binaries. The binaries of clean and dirty. So I started working with this tactical theater collective called The Aliens in Green, and we worked primarily between 2016 to 2000. 18 or 19. And we started to do these like very, very long and orchestrated and durational workshop performances. So here we have like 25 participants in a workshop that lasts over eight hours. And we've constructed almost like a dramaturgy. So we have like act one, act two, act three. And throughout this whole process, we're uh, we're kind of forcing the participants to do all kinds of like um, confusing tasks. So kind of mimicking this alien abduction and creating this crisis in the body. This is the act one. We create this crisis in the body. And then as the workshop continues, we are actually neutralizing the crisis. We're coming to this point of neutrality where you can start to come up with new subjectivities. And that's what I mean by how do we live, care, and act in this permanently polluted world. We need more diverse subjectivities and not just the ones that we've been given. So it was from working with the aliens in green that I started to think, well, biohacking is not just about learning new technical skills, but it can also be used to target 
the immaterial, the emotional, the emotional affect of the participants, because this is real, this is a real thing. And so from there, I started this a new project called the Molecular Queering Agency that is exactly targeting the trauma that I mentioned in the very beginning, this double trauma, and using biohacking to figure out where the trauma is living inside of the body. So, of course, this uses not just biohacking, but some performative strategies as well. And these performance strategies can involve... Uh, some choreography, it can involve props, wearing costumes, it can involve doing rituals, performing a ritual, performing as a cult. So these are all strategies that I'm combining with biohacking to try to pull out where that fear is and then neutralizing it. Here are some close-ups. So we actually are doing the urine hormone extraction right here. So this is another example of how I've used a biohacking protocol um, into a, a new kind of world-making exercise. And this is a kind of, I actually call this my artist toolkit. So a toolkit that I always refer back to every time I'm giving a presentation like this or a workshop, or doing any kind of project, this is the narrative that I always kind of follow. So actually, I'm doing it right now in this presentation. Uh, step one, toxicities. You live in an alien landscape that has been colonized by hormones. Step two, semiosis. You are already alien. You have plastics in your body, in your blood, in your urine, in your fat tissues. And lastly, we come to part three, subjectivities, which is asking you, do you want to be more alien than you already are? So we're now in part three, the genesis of caressing oceans. So last year, um, I gave kind of like this performance workshop in Lisbon in Portugal. And we decided to do something like very site-specific. So we went to this uh, abandoned construction site um, that you know the tourism industry you know started to build this hotel and then stopped and left all this trash behind by the seaside. And we started to scavenge for all these materials that we thought were very interesting to us. Um, they were just these as assemblages of organic and non-organic matter. And then we brought them back to this venue where we put on these blindfolds and we did a blind sensing exercise. And the reason why we do this exercise is because so much of Western binary logic is actually produced through ocular sensing, right? So, for example, Donna Haraway describes this very well about this God trick where you have to see it to believe it. So I thought, well, what kinds of knowledges can be produced in a non-ocular way? So that's why we do this blind sensing exercise, and as a result, we're actually producing this new intimacy with these alien materials, with the scavenged materials. And then, after that, with this new intimate knowledge, we start to do this scenography building. So this is very much the world-making that is happening with the alienated scavenged materials. So this is a time-lapse. We did about one hour. And the only rule is that you are now allowed to speak. So all of your collective decision-making must be done somatically without speaking. And then lastly, we kind of had this like public performance where we really animated the space. We brought it to life. We did a contact improvisation. We were reading from some sci-fi writings that we did earlier. We were making sounds with contact microphones. Um, because we knew after this performance is over, we would just clean up everything. And this new world that we've constructed will be gone. So we did this again in Lithuania in an abandoned sewing factory. So here's all the trash that we found. This is the blind sensing exercise. 
And here we are doing the scenography building. So this is very much related to the idea of material agency and the fact that these molecules, these materials, have their own vibrancy. They have their own agency and ability to even tell stories in this world, right? In this toxic world. And we are part of that story. And this is, these exercises that I'm showing you, it's a way to bring that story to life. So here's the final product. Some, and we also did the urine hormone extraction as a kind of ritual. And then this one, this version is really interesting. So, um, so this is in Vienna, and they asked me to do this multiple day workshop. So previously, all these slides I showed you, it lasts over two to three days. They wanted me to condense it into two hours. So this is a two hour version. So um, we didn't have a chance to go to a toxic site, so we decided we will create our toxic site by simulating catastrophe. So here we are actually destroying all of these materials. And then from there, we did the blind sensing exercise. This actually, the, uh, the catastrophe part took only five minutes. Uh, and then... And then here is the scenography building where we start to do our world making. And then lastly, this is a video of what the performance kind of looks like. Um, actually, there is sound here. I forgot to tell the technicians, but it's okay. And then, Wait a second, sorry. Ah, okay, all right. So, that's weird. Okay. So that just concludes my presentation. Um, I just wanna add that you know, there are ways out of the ruins. You know, I think that when we are stuck in this panic and fear, it actually paralyzes us from collectivizing. It actually paralyzes us from coming up with new strategies. And all it takes is discarding the old world so that you have room to build a new one. So thank you very much. Thank mm -hmm. you.